I just presented uh, as part of a symposium with Dr. Herb Parties, and my talk was on introducing a precision medicine-based approach to psychiatry. In terms of learning from the sort of precision medicine revolution that has been taking place in field other parts of medicine like oncology, um, where they've shown really elegantly in the last decade or so that if you are able to characterize genetic risk factors for a given form of cancer and if you figure out what the disease mechanism is that is associated with that mutation, that if you find drugs that are screened for that to repair that whatever the signaling deficit is, that you see dramatic improvement in cancer clinical outcomes uh, in patients with cancer. So in psychiatry, in my lab and in my center, we're trying to sort of learn from that approach and take a similar approach in psychiatry where we do whole genome and exome sequencing studies, we identify mutations, we have different model systems to screen for disease mechanisms, we then screen drugs, and whichever drug looks good in that model system, we then take back to the actual patient or cohort of patients where we found the mutation and do small targeted uh, trials with those medicines. My lab is sort of agnostic about conditions. We are interested in most psychiatric conditions, but we have a specific um, focus on right now on autism spectrum disorder and psychotic disorders. In particular because those are very debilitating disorders that have very few medications available for them that are effective and don't really impact the quality of life much, so that's where the need is the highest. And it also happens that in those particular groups of disorders, the same signaling pathways appear to be involved at least partially as also is the case in different forms of cancer. So there's already a lot of really excellent drugs available that we can reappropriate for that, repurpose. It's hard to say. I mean, I graduated in 2009, and then I did a, a fellowship in the labs of Dr. Skariorgu and Gogo, Gogos, where I was trained in making transgenic animal models of mental disorders. And shortly after that, I did a, did a translational fellowship. And in the last two years, I've had my own lab and research center. Um, so in earnest, the research has been going on for the last five to seven years. And even before I did a Fulbright scholarship, I was already working on this back in 2000. Uh, that work has all led to here, but in earnest, really trying precision medicine-based approaches like this in the last two, three years. Well, one of the most striking things we're finding, I think, is that um, what, is, what surprised me is that there's convergence on the signaling level with a lot of uh, oncological disorders, so that the same sort of core set of signaling pathways that play a role in a lot of fundamental human disorders or disorders in different species that play a role in signaling the pathway that play a role in met metabolic disorders like diabetes, different forms of cancer, and now also play a role in, in the brain disorders that we're interested in. So. Um, that's been a fascinating discovery of the last several years by many labs, including ours. Beyond that, what I've found uh, fascinating so far is that I work with founder populations, genetically, genetic, uh, genetically isolated populations like the Old Order Amish, Mennonite populations, patients in populations in South America that are genetically isolated and separate from other communities um, because they're usually inbred populations. That working with those populations and working with the genetic homogeneity that always exists in these kinds of populations has made it a lot easier to do our genetic studies, has made it a lot easier to generate stem cell models based on that, because you eliminate a lot of the noise, and I, I believe that working with those populations will really help further what we're trying to do and test whether precision medicine can, approaches can be applied to psychiatry as well. We, I think we have to start with genetically homogenous populations like these founder populations that we work with, because if it's possible, it should be, we should be able to demonstrate it there before we go to the general population. Yeah, exactly. So one example is that we're now about to do a clinical trial with a, 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 a relatively rare, but not in the Amish, so it's a, a mutation in a gene called CTNAP2, um, which is quite rare in the general population. So it's basically impossible to recruit enough people in the general population from all over the world to come to one place to do a trial with a drug, even though we found a drug that targets the disease mechanism associated with that mutation. Um, but in the Amish population, because when they emigrated in the late 1600s, one of the 60 original founding members had a mutation most likely in this gene and because of the bottleneck effect because then they gave rise, those 60 people gave rise to what ultimately became the Amish community which is two, three hundred thousand people I believe. Um, you get what is called a bottleneck effect and now that mutation is actually quite common in the Amish population. So as a result of that many people are affected by that mutation and have neuropsychiatric conditions 
But what's fascinating is that they, it's happening in a genetic background that is extremely homogenous because, again, it's, they're very comparable, these people, because they're related. So it's easier to just decipher what is relevant for a disease and what's not. And not only that, they have an inherited identical mutation in that gene, a loss of function mutation. So normally, a slightly different mutation in a general population, even in the same gene, may have dramatically different effects on the protein, ultimately, whether there's a functional protein expressed or not, for example. So here we have the luxury to say we have the same mutation in a genetically homogenous population, in a, group, in a population that doesn't do drugs, doesn't drink alcohol, that is environmentally exposed to the same thing, that all live in the same area, and are all extremely motivated to join for a, a clinical trial. So we're, we're hoping to, to learn more if we, when we carry that study forward.